Welcome to Ohara. It's time to explore the depths of your mind, your sanity, and your fear. I hope you're sitting comfortably. Enjoy. The Strange Tale of the Tunnel There's a tunnel on top of this embankment. Trees all around, unkept. Far more overgrown than before, but still familiar. After some twenty years away, I'm back in my hometown, at the foot of the Wicked Mountain on the outskirts, looking for an old tunnel. I came at last, helplessly drawn here, like that evil tunnel was sucking me in all over again. I gazed out into the darkness, a gaping void of black lay before me, between the tree lines, it truly wasn't far now. The area was completely overgrown, but I knew the tunnel was there on the other side was lying there with his mouth open, waiting for me. Yes, the tunnel was waiting for me. I kept going, armies of sticks crunching beneath my feet from years of growth. The town may have forgotten about the tunnel or faded it into an urban legend, but I never forgot. I fled this town decades ago. I thought I would never stand before this tunnel again let alone even think about stepping foot inside. But I knew deep down that I would return. My oldest memory of the tunnel goes back nearly 30 years. A woman walking barefoot along the stony train tracks. No one else around but me. She walked alone into the tunnel and disappeared before my eyes, like she was sucked into it. And then... My god, we hit someone. Another suicide? The train conductor called out, pulling hard on the brakes as the flume of steam above shrank to a whisper. That woman was my mother. No one had any idea why she would have committed suicide. My aunt told me that, as the big brother, I had to be strong and take care of my sister Mari. She was young and didn't know anything yet, so... It was entrusted to me that I show her the way. Many people showed up to the funeral. Friends, family, locals. You can almost hear the whole crowd mourning, despite their solemn silence. My aunt was right though. Mari was far too young to understand. She sat in my aunt's arms, sucking her thumb, not grasping why everyone was dressed in black, nor why her mother was no longer around. The responsibility was etched into my brain. I was no older than ten, yet I had to remain strong, despite losing my mother right before me. It wasn't too long before the tunnel went out of use. It wasn't boarded up or anything, just left to rot and to be forgotten like the countless souls that had been lost in there. A few years later, time had moved on and I had pushed the memories aside to focus on my future and Mari. I was walking home from school with some classmates. I wouldn't call them friends, but I enjoyed their company at the least. Hide, the leader of the group, turned to us and said, Hey guys, I have an idea. I want to go exploring the old tunnel. The two others stopped in their tracks, stunned at the proposition. They both said, what? in unison, clearly horrified at the thought. What? Are you guys scared? No, we're not we're not scared or nothing. He tried to hide his fear, but it was very clear from his expression or tone. Okay then, we're all set. We'll go get flashlights and then meet up. Hey Goro, you come too. I know he was just taunting me, as everyone knew what had happened to my mother. They did not expect to return there so soon, however. Uh-huh. So are you scared, a wimp? I'm not scared, I said. 
Wait, wait, hold on. That tunnel is where Goro's mum... Exactly. So that's why he should definitely come. He probably knows it like the back of his hand anyway. I really did not want to, but the childish part of my brain did also not want to be left out. Or call the wimp. So we went our separate ways and met up a few hours later. The gaping mouth of the tunnel was there. It was just like I remember it. Only with a few more moss patches and broken bricks. We didn't waste much time at all. We entered slowly and cautiously, illuminating as much of the space as we could with the flashlights. I noticed there was another difference. The tracks were completely gone. No trace of them either. I thought it was a rather strange decision to move the train tracks on top of closing the tunnel, but I didn't think much more into it. We walked onward as a group. I occasionally looked back out of habit and the darkness was suffocating. Any patch that wasn't under a narrow beam of light looked like an endless void of nothing. Because of the distance we had walked and the way the tunnel had curved, we could no longer see the entrance nor any sign of an exit. Hey, um, if your mum's ghost shows up, t tell her we're cool, okay? It's not just Gora's mum, you know. When the train was running, it hit loads of people. They all sort of staggered into the tunnel. My dad says the tunnel called to them. He was right. People did say the tunnel was evil, with fears of the mountain going way back even before the tunnel existed. So building a tunnel directly through a place considered so evil was simply asking for trouble. Hey, hey day, how far are we going anyway? Until we get there, he replied. There? Where's there? Truth is, I heard there's something in the middle of this tunnel, and we are going to go see it. I don't know what it is, but we are going to find it. He seemed so curious, but I thought to myself, what could be in this old tunnel? I looked up at the ceiling and noticed some strange marks along the walls. They appeared to be some kind of scratches, but not the kind made by a passing train. I said they had to have made by accidents. One time a train supposedly tipped over several times, and I imagined how awful that must have been. During the war, many people supposedly died. In one incident, the passengers tried to get out of the tunnel, and while they were wandering around, over half of them disappeared. Yeah, sometimes the track workers went inside and never came back out again. And then, on nights after someone died or disappeared inside the tunnel, it would shine this pale light or something like blood would drip from the ceiling and walls. A ghost train would come through, stuff like that. I heard about this girl in work clothes standing there, covered in blood. I felt the group shudder. Quit it with the weird stuff. Don't tell scary stories inside the scary tunnel. You think you can get me to turn around with that? He stood still and continued his rant for a moment. He appeared to have finished as a droplet fell onto his head and he screamed, Hey, t take a look at my head. Did blood just drip on it? Is it blood? What? Don't scare us like that. It's just regular water. You jerk. It's because you're saying all that stuff. He tried to feign his fear, but I could see it in his eyes. I turned around once more and said aloud, Hey guys. They all turned to me, and I pointed down the end of the tunnel. I could just make out the faint silhouette of a small girl. We all looked in horror, and then the three screamed, and fled back the way we came. I stayed, however, curious. I shone my light towards her, and was shocked. It was Mari, tears streaming down her cheeks. Mari, what are you doing here? You came in alone without a flashlight? Why would you do that? I, I don't know. Before I knew it, I was just here. Are you stupid. Uh, how do you not know what you're doing here? Come on, we're, we're going home. I took her hand and we ran off towards the entrance. Her cries echoed throughout the tunnel. Maybe she was just missing mum, but she doesn't know that mum killed herself here. Maybe someone at school told her. 
I rushed home, dragging Mari with me. We got inside and I got Mari into bed straight away. She fell asleep with no hesitation or disturbance. And I went into the kitchen and told my dad what had happened. Is she asleep? I nodded. She has a fever, so she should probably stay at home from school tomorrow. She went to that tunnel all by herself, without even realising, my dad said. That's what worries me. They say that tunnel calls to people. It is a fact that a lot of people have died or gone missing there. Your own mother too, and that was no suicide. And even now, Mari? Anyway, we obviously can't let her go to the tunnel again. You keep an eye on her. I nodded and went up to bed. That night I felt so heavy and dull I couldn't sleep. It was a strange lethargy I had never felt before. The next day, we were met with a heavy snowfall, coating the streets and houses with a thick lining of white. The news said it was a blizzard, which was unusual for the area. I went straight home after school, thinking about Mum, about the tunnel and Mari. I opened the door and shook off the snow. I'm home, I said. Goro, have you seen Mari? No. She's dead at home from school today, right? She did, but when I went to check on her, she wasn't there. She must have gone out. I was shocked, but it hit me straight away. The tunnel. I don't know where she is, but she's got a fever. She can't be out in the weather like this. I'm going to go look for her, so stay here in case she comes home. He threw his winter jacket and boots on, and ran out the door into the blizzard. Hours went by, and he still hadn't returned. I hoped that maybe he found her and they were on their way home, but I wasn't convinced. He had been gone way too long. Maybe he also went to the tunnel. I headed out, grabbing a flashlight as well. Thankfully, the snowfall had slowed, so I could see much further than before. I ran as fast as I could towards the tunnel. Not a single soul around. As I got closer, I noticed footprints, distinctive tracks of someone walking through the snow. Started with one set, then another appeared just to the side, smaller but with the same direction. They had to be Mari's and Dad's. And as I stopped, my fears were realised. The tracks led directly towards the tunnel. The footprints only went one way, so they must still be inside. I took a deep breath and followed the footprints into the abyss. It seemed darker than before. Maybe my eyes just hadn't adjusted to the darkness yet, or the lack of additional lights. In any case, it was different. The ceiling dripped constantly, the droplets reverberating through the tunnel. Before I knew it, it was pitch black all around me. I don't know how long I walked, as time seemed to cease to exist. My head was starting to get wet and irritated by the water trips, but I soon forgot about that when I noticed a faint light up ahead. I walked faster to catch up to whatever it was, maybe my dad or Mari, but it was neither. A flashlight, lying still on the ground in front of me. I recognised it straight away. It was Dad. I called out in sheer panic, begging for any signs of life of Dad, of Mari, but nothing. Only droplets of liquid continuing to pour from above. Then I noticed something ahead. Not darkness any longer, but a wall. A flat surface with what looked like a door in the centre. I didn't believe it at first, so I walked close and sure enough it was a door. It was blocking the tunnel completely. The sign above read, Cosmic Ray Observatory, Cosmic Ray Research Laboratory, Toto University. Why would they build something like this here? I didn't hesitate to open the door. I was careful to do so slowly and quietly, and peered inside. It was exactly as the sign had said. Inside was an array of devices, cables, machinery, and metal rails, all high-tech looking, and certainly not what I would expect to find from an old railway. Further down the room was another door, presumably to the other side of the tunnel, and just before it, three people dressed in lab coats and a girl. Mari. I called out her name, but she didn't look up. Only the scientists seemed to notice my presence. 
I paused as they stared at me. The lady approached me. What is it, young man? Do you know this girl? She's my sister, I replied. Oh, is that right? She came here to get her? She looked at Mari. You mustn't come here again, do you understand? My dad should also be here, I said. Where is he? Your dad? Well, we haven't seen him. I thought it strange that Mari had turned up, but my dad hadn't. Maybe Mari was the one who took his flashlight. I asked if the tunnel kept going through the door on the other side, and I was told that the lab was at the very centre of the mountain. That meant that dad couldn't be here, otherwise they would have seen him go through. It's so weird I didn't see him. I know he was here because of the footprints. Well, maybe you just didn't see him. The tunnel is very dark after all. There is no way I didn't see him, I replied. It's a straight tunnel, and I had my flashlight on the whole time. Well, in that case, we can go check the other side. We can use the truck we commute in. Oh, you've got something on your cheek. It's blood. Are you all right? I hadn't noticed till now, but she was right. There was a drop of blood trickling down my cheek. I assumed it was just water at first, but I said I was fine, and we kept going through the other door. It was just as dark and menacing. They had a small truck parked at the side of the door, with three seats in the front for us. I asked the lady to check her side for any signs, and I would check mine as we drove. The headlights illuminated the tunnel far more than my pitiful flashlight, but I used it carefully to check the alcoves in the walls. Can you slow down, please? Okay, sure. There's the exit up ahead. Sure enough, natural light was up ahead, and we were bathed in sunlight. I checked the ground, but there were no signs of any footprints at all. Dad had not come out this way. Not a single footprint in the fresh snow. This was all very strange to me. I asked her to turn us around and we went speeding back through. Maybe Dad disappeared in the tunnel. Loads of people have gone missing here. Ridiculous. Such an unscientific phenomenon. I'm sure your dad has already gone home. What is a cosmic ray laboratory anyway? I asked. She seemed very happy to answer that question. Well, it's a place where we measure cosmic rays, which are a type of radiation that rains down from us from space. Invisible microparticles, because their radiation, they can pass through the human body like x-rays. They even go thousands of meters into the earth. So they come through the mountain and radiate in here too. We're using this old tunnel to measure them. It's a joint project with several universities. I didn't really understand, but I tried my best to nod and sound interested. We only recently set up, but the machine are already breaking down and giving us strange readings, so everyone's on edge. It appeared the tunnel was even stranger than I thought. Dad really was just gone. I could only assume he disappeared in the tunnel. We said goodbye and me and Mari walked back out. But Mari wandered into the tunnel over and over again, each time I got a call from the observatory and had to go get her. I'm scared, Goro. Why do I keep coming here? I don't even know. She wouldn't stop crying, was completely inconsolable. Do you have any relatives elsewhere? The lady asked. Why don't you go stay with them until your father's found? It was hard for us, just the two of us, but leaving did sound like a good idea if it meant Mario would stop coming into the tunnel. Oh, for Pete's sake, what's wrong? We can't get any work done like this. I can't see any issues with the machines, but the data's a mess. The other doctor collapsed, holding his head. Oh, Professor, are you all right? Yes, I'm, I'm fine. I've just been strangely tired since we've been working in the tunnel. Professor, to tell the truth, I've also been strangely exhausted. Just then, the third doctor burst through the rear door. Professor, you have to look at this. It's the commemorative photo we took the other day. He held out a piece of paper with a photograph on it. It was clearly an image of the tunnel door with the three of them in front of it. However, around all the walls were these figures. 
that looked like people screaming, being stretched from one wall to the other, flying into and through the doctors and back out into the walls, hundreds of them, in all directions, all with the same tormented expression. What is this? It's like there are these things flying around the tunnel. Look closer. They don't look like people. Like human-shaped things are whizzing through the tunnel at incredible speed. They do look like people indeed, the lady said. But why would they be in the photo? Look, it's as if they're coming out of the walls and disappearing into them. They are passing through our bodies just like x-rays. My first instinct as the naive child was ghosts. It made sense to me because of all the missing people and cosmic rays is only a small mental gap to angry spirits. What if our data anomalies are actually measurements of these things? The professor said. What if they're still flying around the tunnel right now and we just can't see them with our own eyes? Doctor, what if they're going through our bodies? Well, he started. Perhaps it's akin to being bathed with large amounts of radiation. Assuming, of course, these things actually exist. It might explain why we haven't been feeling very well. They discussed some more and mentioned that it might be dangerous to stay in the tunnel. I guess it made sense whether it was radiation or ghosts. I decided it was best for us to leave and I led Mari once again out of the tunnel. The Cosmic Ray Lab was shut down shortly after that. Before long, my sister and I were taken in by our aunt in Tokyo. We were going to move there permanently, and everything was prepared. Around the time we had just finished packing, I looked around my old room at the filled boxes and realised... Where was Mari? Not the tunnel, please, not the tunnel. The phone shook violently. I dashed for it. Hello? Yes, Goro, it's me from the lab. You have to come right away. Something terrible's happened. Hello? What's going on? It cut off. This again. The same situation. Mari gone. Me running to the tunnel. Flashlight in hand. I ran. Faster and faster. Across roads, through the forest, and into the darkness. I thought the tunnel was closed, so... Why would they be calling me from there? I sprinted as fast as I could splashing through the puddles on the ground and reaching the door faster than ever before. I swung it open fast. Mari, where are you? The door to the other side was wide open. I jumped through and saw the three scientists and Mari, but the good news ended there. The first doctor was only partly visible, his white lab coat stained with trickling blood and his shoulders upwards was completely immersed in the wall, his limbs twitching slightly. The professor was screaming. His upper half remained on the surface, but I could see he was slowly slipping into the ground. The female doctor was holding Mari, both screaming, but not yet captured by the tunnel. Koro, help the professor, help him! I can see them! I can actually see them! He cried out. There are people flying around inside the tunnel. They're going through the walls. We are too. I'm slipping into the ground. Impossible. Someone tell me why. The earth is so hard. Why are we being absorbed by it? He slipped further and further. Till all that was visible was his head. Then his face. And then just the tips of his fingers. Clawing at the ground. Then he was just gone. Without a trace. We came here again, the lady started. Even though it was closed, it was like we were pulled in. Goro, I'm scared. Mari continued to cry. She clung on tight to the doctor and kept repeating those same words, but nothing could have stopped it. She too began to fall, straight through the doctor and slowly into the floor. The lady pulled away as this happened. I'm scared. She fell into the ground, and I rushed for her hand, but no matter how hard I pulled, she just kept slipping. I even tried to go with her, but it was as if the ground was solid for me, but liquid for her. Mari! Mari! I pulled my hand away. Blood. We have to run. We have to get out of the tunnel. Now. We were gone. Just the flashlights as a source of light. 
We ran further and further. But the entrance wasn't even in sight. Hurry. We have to hurry. I told her. Something's coming after us, Goro, she said. I looked up and saw the three who had just seeped into the tunnel. The doctor, the professor, and Mari. They were mangled, covered in gashes and blood, with the same expression they were making when they left, but instead of eyes, there was dark, dripping voids. They were screaming, screaming so loudly, and darting across the ceiling, through the walls, and back up through the floor. Don't leave us, they cried out. The corpse of the doctor fell straight through and on top of the lady. She collapsed in shock, but it just fell through her. They became intertwined almost, and soon she too was sucked into the tunnel. The last thing again was her hand reaching out for help. I didn't stop. I kept running, blood dripping everywhere. Screams from every angle. Help me, Goro! I didn't look back. My little sister just died and I didn't even look back. I ran. I abandoned my sister in sheer terror. As I raced through the tunnel, the things I hadn't been able to see before became visible. Bodies, souls, spirits, cosmic rays, whatever they were. Hundreds shooting through the walls in all directions. They were the many people who had been absorbed by this tunnel. They shot through my body without mercy, all with that open-mouthed expression. To me, they looked like insects bouncing around, the stone prison of the evil mountain, all trying to escape. I reached the exit mostly unscathed, aside from being covered in blood that thankfully was not mine. I didn't tell anyone about the tunnel. If I did, people would find out that I abandoned my little sister. I grew up at my aunt's house from then on, but the pain in my heart was never ending. On top of that, I was tired and listless. For no reason. My aunt would tell me stories of people going missing in the town. Every time I received news like that, I would scream in my heart. It was the tunnel. Why would no one investigate the tunnel? Everyone is being sucked into it. Unable to get a job and live a proper life, I stayed locked up in my aunt's house for many years. Morning did not begin to describe the feeling. My sister, my mother, my father, all lost to the tunnel. My aunt too passed away recently. And before I knew it, I was walking into that hometown. The place had gotten sad in the decade since I left. It was like most of the residents had vanished. If they had, it was into the tunnel, of course. The people swallowed up by that tunnel could never escape. The stone shell of the mountain. It turns out that nor could I. After twenty years... The tunnel looked even more repulsive. Blood staining the ceiling. Scratches everywhere. I can see them now. I can still see them. All those familiar faces. <laughs>